guys, it's Nick the Booksmith. Welcome back, welcome back. I hope everybody is um, doing all right. It's been a hot minute since my last video. I flew down to Dallas to visit my brother and his family, so that happened and now I'm back. It was warm down there. I mean, it's hot here too. I think, I mean, it's in the 90s today, which we haven't had very many hot days this year yet, but yeah, it was like 95% humidity and 98 degrees down there. So it was sultry, just a little tiny bit sultry. So today I thought I would make a junk journal of sorts from an old book cover that I came across in my stash. I believe it's from about maybe 1905, 1910 ish and it does have some damage on the spine so I'll have to line the inside of it but I really think this cover is pretty cool I thought something needs to be done with it so a book it is I have a pile of papers to my right that I just grabbed out of my stash of stuff but I also want to use some just regular paper paper. I don't want every single page in there to be from a book of sheet music or dictionary or you know something. So what I did was I grabbed this pad of newsprint and what's great about newsprint is that it's not white white. It's kind of a dingy ivory, which is great if you don't want a stark contrast between maybe some of the book pages you'll be using. They're already older, vintagey. It just kind of, they blend a little bit better. So this one, I think this one was from Hobby Lobby a couple of moons ago. It is the 12 by 18 sheets. There are 50 sheets in here. However, they're they're big. There's really like a hundred if you cut them down for more of a standard size book. If you cut them in half, they're still gonna be nine inches tall by 12 inches wide. Another thing that's great about um, the newsprint is that at least when I bought this paper pad, the grain direction in the paper is running from this end to this end, so it's long grain because this is the longest direction so it's long grain. I don't know if you can see that. I can see the striations in the paper. But anyway, this works out well because I'm going to be cutting the paper in half or less in this direction and then this will be folded in, in this direction with the grain. And that's exactly what I want. So that's a little trick that I like to use. I made a video, it's been a few videos back where it was talking about just tips and tricks for book binding. And one of them was that it's best if you fold your papers, if you're gonna be folding your papers and sewing them into a binding, that we really do want the grain to be running with the spine of the book. So parallel to the spine of the book, which means we would need to fold it in that direction. But then I got a lot of folks that were like, well, but when I get copy paper, here I grabbed a piece. So the copy paper is also long grain, but a lot of times folks end up wanting to fold it this direction and then make a book about this size. But then you're folding, because the grain's going in this direction, you're folding it against the grain because this would be with the grain. However, when you get a larger sized paper and you're gonna be cutting it in half, if it's long grained, then it's going to be turned into two pieces or however many you want that you cut it into, it'll be short grained, which is good for folding with the grain in this direction. So to show you an example, let me back you out a little bit so you can like see what in the world I'm talking about here. This is the extra that, that this piece of paper was too long. So this was originally the size of the newsprint, correct? So what I ended up doing was, is I took this cover and I just took a ruler and I measured inside the cover 
And usually if you can measure like where the end sheet was pasted down, if you measure the height of that paste down, that is a usually a good reference for how tall your pages should be at the maximum for book binding. Now a junk journal, we play with those rules a little fast and loose, but you know, it's a good range to aim for. Let's just put it that way. With that in mind, I ended up cutting one of these newsprint sheets into an eight inch height and another eight inch height. And then I had like two inches left over, which gets cut off. So now I have two sheets of paper that are eight by 12. And of course I'm gonna have to cut these down as well because you fold them in half and it's gonna be too wide. And I cut them too big for the purpose of printing on something on these. I, I didn't want to cut them all to the exact size I needed because inevitably they're not all gonna be cut the same exact dimension because I always mess up somewhere and some of them are too tall and some of them are too short. And so I wanted to run some of them through the printer first, which I did. So this is what um, some of them look like. I, th I think I have about 20 sheets here. Some of them don't have anything on one side. Some of them have something printed on both sides. And it's just a bunch of randomness. Sometimes it's just lines with a little bit of weeds down here. <laughs> but I tried to make them inobtrusive so that well, except for this page. This is the first one I printed. And then I printed it out and I went, oh, that was dark. <laughs> oh, well, it's okay. And then some of them have lines with other things. And some of these are from kits from my store, my Etsy store. But just some randomness that I figured would look nice inside a junk journal, along with the randomness that I have here which is basically dictionary pages, some sheet music, uh, some pages from a, a typing textbook from the 60s, <laughs> some pages from a gardening book, and a few tea stain pages. Just some randomness, but I figured it would blend real well because this newsprint is kind of a pale linen color as it is. So what I'm going to need to do is trim these down because I, sort of want to aim for the height of these pages to be 187 millimeter. I'll probably trim all these down and have them be that height, even though this is a junk journal. So there's going to be some varying heights because these papers, I can play around with the size of these random papers and I can make it easy on myself and cut these down to what I measured for the inside of the book. Pardon me for just a moment and I will trim the height of these down and I'll be right back. All of these have been trimmed down to that seven and three eighths ish inch. These are obviously too wide, but when I get the papers together and I fold them in half, then I will be able to trim the excess on the ends. I'm not going to do that right this second because I will be putting together the signatures in a bit. What I wanted to do first so that it can be drying is I wanted to put just some fabric or something on the inside to line the spine since there's uh, some cut marks in the spine. I don't know if the text block was attached to the book cloth. I, I don't know. Anyway. So we're not gonna worry about it. I'm just going to take this piece of cloth and line the inside so that that won't rip anymore.
these pages, I've cut down a little bit so that they won't be too tall out of the top of the book. I'm gonna take each one of them and fold them in half the way they'll be bound and just give it a light crease, but nothing that will crease real tight because I still want to put signatures together but I like to be able to put signatures together with a little bit of a crease in the paper. It just helps me to judge what it's going to look like. And it's not necessary. Not everybody does it the way I do it, but it just, it's helpful to me. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Ended up that I wait a minute, is that nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. I have nine signatures with five papers each. Yeah, I think that should be adequate for filling up the spine. But now um, would be the time if I wanted to do any additions as far as like sewing on the pages, adding anything extra. Sometimes what I like to do, if a page is short, I will sew another onto the end. I might fold it around to the other side. Anyway, you know, I do stuff. I do stuff. Um, however, one thing I need to do is guesstimate the approximate width that the pages will need to be. And I'll put one of these signatures into the cover. And this is why I leave the majority of those pages long so I can trim accordingly. Does that make sense? I sewed just the very few little items that I attached, but nothing crazy. I have such a headache. <laughs> I can't I can't manage much more sewing on because of that. We're just gonna we're just gonna leave it how it is. Now um, I'm going to sew these together. Yeah, I just said I can't do more sewing, but I meant elements onto pages. These I'm going to sew together or, well, sew onto something. Because 
This has a, a spine in here that's, you know, it's a little bigger than what this would be if I sewed all these together in a traditional, let's say a traditional binding, then it would be snug together and it'd be too narrow. So in junk journal world, we generally, I'm just going to estimate here about how wide that needs to be in order to fit inside and leave room for, for so that the front and back cover will fold in. You get it, you get it. And if you don't, you will. I'm going to cut it at one and a half just to see how, how that fits. I'm just using this scrap paper. So if I set this in here like this, and then I fold it, I think I need to go a little bit narrower. So let's do like one and three eighths and see how that does. I think this will be much better. Yeah, that's much better. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do, except I need something that's a little sturdier than just that paper. I can use this. So it needs to be you know, the same height as the pages that will fit in here. So that'll work. And now I can cut that to that one and three eighths width that I had guesstimated earlier. And you just want to make sure, so here's the back spine, but do you see like these little foldy spots? Uh, that's the hinge gap. And you wanna make sure that this little piece in here fits inside, but it doesn't cover those little hinge gap areas that will be folding, because that will keep your book from folding correctly. So as long as it folds up nice, it should be just fine. Where is, I'm losing everything. Okay, I wanna use millimeters because it's easier to divide that in half. So this is like 34 millimeters wide. So mark at the 17, cause that's half of 34, right? I took some headache medicine, so hopefully it will kick in soon. So there we go. Let's see if that looks about right. Yeah, you know, I'm sure it's fine. Then, because um, we have nine signatures, or we, me and the mouse in my pocket have nine signatures, this middle line can hold the exact middle signature, and then I'll have four on one side and four on the other. So I just need to mark that. And what I usually like to do is draw a, a line that is like, uh, like maybe an eighth of an inch, which is like three millimeters away from each edge because I don't want the holes to be poking through the edge of this paper or cardstock. And then what's good about that is then I need three and three, right? Because I've already taken care of one and one. So this is one, two, three, and then we'll have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's one good thing about having an odd number of signatures is that you can mark the center and then you can come in from eighth of an inch from one edge and mark a line and an eighth of an inch from this side and mark a line. And then you still have three and three, which is easy to divide this space, each space into, because you find the middle of those two, which is, let's see, what's the middle? It's like 14. So if I do seven, so there's five, six, and seven. So there's the middle on that. And then over here, we should do that again. And mark five, six, seven. So there's the middle on that. And then I just have to find the center here, 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 and here, which I could probably eyeball, but not with a headache. Half of seven is like one, two, three and a half. And then one, two, three and a half. One, two, three 
and a half, and then one, two, three, and a half. If you have like grid paper with little teeny tiny grid lines on it, sometimes that's helpful too. When you're working with a book cover that is it's already made, you have to work with the space you have and figure out the math, or at least eyeball well. <laughs> I mean, if they're not exact, it's not going to be the end of the world. I can guarantee you these these are not exact. But you know what? We're, we're just going to go with it. It is what it is. After those lines are drawn, I'm going to mark a half an inch down from the top and the bottom. And then those will be my top and bottom holes. And then I want to put two more in here because I want an even number. So if this is like six and a quarter inches or about 52 or 152 millimeters. So if I get my calculator out because the math ain't mathing when I'm uh, when my brain isn't working. <laughs> So it's about 50 millimeters if I divide by three, because that's what I want to do. Clear, or 6.25 divided by, oops, that's not right. 6.25 divided by three, about two inches. So if I come to, if I put my two inch line on that first line we just marked and come down two inches from that, then I can mark that and then I should be able to put the two inch line on, if I can find it, <laughs> Lord, on that one and I can mark it here. And then there should be approximately two inches in the middle. And it really doesn't matter too much. There's like two and an eighth inches, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm gonna mark this with a T up at the top so that I know, so that I know where the top is should be because we are all humans and we are prone to error. <laughs> and so this line may be a couple of millimeters different from where this line is from the edge, you know. So if you mark the T and you always know where the top of your page is and you got four holes in here, which we'll put in there in a minute, then we we know that it, even if it's a little bit off, that they'll all be the same amount of off, <laughs> which sounds horrible. Nobody wants to be off, but here we are. We're off, but we're off fabulously. And then, so now wherever these lines intersect, I will take a pokey tool, and this is just an ice pick, and I will poke a hole on each of these four lines. And then those will be, there we go, those will be my sewing stations. Does that sound copacetic? I think we'll get this, headache or no headache. So let me tell you what started the headache while I'm poking holes. So I have like a hose timer that is hooked up to the outside faucet. And that is what my irrigation system that I set up for the very few vegetables I have in the garden. It's set up to this timer because if I'm out of town, if I don't feel good, whatever it is, I can turn it on and water the garden from, I mean, like I said, I just came back from Dallas. So I could water the garden from Dallas, right? Modern technology, it's just it's a wonderful thing. Anyway, for some ungodly reason, we don't know why, because why would we? It came disconnected from like the, um, there's like a little Wi-Fi hub that's plugged in inside and it talks to that. Well, all of a sudden it decided not to talk to that anymore. Why? I don't know. I didn't get a new router. I didn't change my Wi-Fi password. We just don't know. Yeah. So, oh, here, here, let me, before I go on with my story, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a scrap of paper, which I just had, here it is, and I'm going to place this on top like this, and I will take a pokey tool again, and I will mark, I'll just pick one of these lines, and I'm just going to pick the, the middle one. 
I'm going to poke through one row all the way down. And what that will do is I'll be able to use this paper template to poke through my papers. So that's what I'm doing, so now you know. Okay, I will move on with my story. So what does a person do? I wanna mark a T up at the top too. I try to repair it with the hub inside. It wasn't working. So then I was like, well, okay, I'll turn on the, because it has a Bluetooth option as well, which I don't want it on the Bluetooth option because you have to be, like you'd have to be within 30 feet from it at all times, which kind of defeats the purpose if you're gonna go out of town. But I mean, we just got back, so I, I was like, well, whatever. I just need to water the vegetables in the garden. And it's like 96, 97 degrees today. I have lupus. I'm not supposed to be out in the sun anyway. I will end up in the ER again. So we try to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> Talk about wasting an entire day. Yeah, the ER will do that. I try to hook it up with the Bluetooth. It doesn't even want to do that. It has decided that is just not gonna happen. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Because I don't mind. Let me get my, uh, this is my little cradle, poking cradle. It's a, it's a cradle of some kind. I can't remember exactly what they're named. Please excuse my, my lack of brain cells today. I think I've, I've used up my quota. <laughs> So anyway, it just it just didn't want to hook up. So I was like, okay, I restart my phone. I reset the um, the Wi-Fi hub inside. I reset the the hose timer itself, you know, outside because there's like a reset button on it. And then try to you know hook it up again, just like fresh, like it was never hooked up. Nope, now it's telling me that there's not enough water pressure. I was like, well, there was enough water pressure yesterday. What happened? So I take it apart because I'm like, well, maybe there's like a, a clog in like the filter because there's a, well, I mean, there's filters in most hoses. So I thought, well, maybe it got, I don't know, something in the filter. I don't know. No, no, there wasn't. There was nothing in the filter. It was perfectly fine. So then I, I totally like deleted the app and reinstalled it because I thought, well, maybe the app is just, you know, messing up. Nope, that, that didn't help. That didn't work. It's still not wanting to connect. Well, finally, I don't know what it was that I did, but finally it was like all of a sudden it saw the, the timer, right? It saw the hose timer. And I was like, yes. And it says, do you want to connect? Yes, yes I do. That is exactly what I want to do. And so it connects, yay, success. And it says, would you like to use your timer? Yes, yes I would. The whole point of this whole exercise was so that I could use my hose timer to turn on my drip system. <laughs> so I say I want to water manually, which means I'm not using like the timer function because we've already missed the time, the timing that needed to be done. So we're just gonna have to turn this sucker on. And I say, you know, please turn on for 15 minutes and I hit start and it pops up this screen that says, starting to water manually. And I'm like, yay! And the little screen pops up that it's starting. I can hear like the hose shuts on because like the timer allows the water to go through. Right, so the, the faucet's always on. It's just that the timer has like a shut off valve. And when you turn on the timer, it allows the water to go through, right? So I hear that click, click, and water goes through. And then it immediately shuts off. And I'm like, what, what? So it's turning on, but it immediately shuts off after about, I don't know, a second and a half. Never done that before. So it's connected and it's speaking to the Wi-Fi and it's allowing the water to flow, but only for, you know, a millisecond. I don't know what's up with that. Literally spent three hours of my life today. Cause you know, we all have an extra three hours, right? To just willy nilly, just waste for absolutely no productivity coming out of it at all. Like 
nothing. I succeeded in nothing. I am more confused than when I started, hence the headache. And if I got a headache because I worked on something for a while, but at least I solved the problem, is it worth a headache? I mean, maybe, depends on the headache. If it ends up being a migraine and I have to go to bed and put my head under a pillow, no, it's usually not worth it. Hopefully I caught it quickly enough to where we don't end up in that territory. There's the holes, by the way, gang. That is my life today. Probably a lot more information than you wanted to know. <laughs> There's people that come in here and I'm not dogging on people because I understand because I watch YouTube channels and people do this to me and I'm like, I don't wanna know your life story. Just make the thing that you're making. Just show me how to make the thing. Why am I clapping? I don't know. Just show me how to make the thing. Move along. <laughs> but there's people are, that are in here going, you know, that's a lot of chit chat. I really don't need to hear about your life. I don't want to know about your struggles today. But then there's others, those of you that actually, you know, know me and have been around me for a minute, you know that I always have something, a struggle to share. <laughs> You're here for it. You're all in. And you guys are like, no, tell us what's going on. <laughs> when the other people are like, no, shut it off. <laughs> I don't want to know about your stupid life. Well, too bad you got my stupid life today, at least a little bit of it. If you don't want to hear, you can always speed me up and turn off my voice. I don't care. It's not going to hurt my feelings. I don't have feelings anymore. I got rid of those a long time ago when I first came on the internet. You can't really have a whole lot of feelings on the internet. Okay, so now I need a needle. I think that one will work. And that is one of, one of the... Um, top points or tips of advice. Tips of advice? Advice tips? Advice points? Yeah, words are hard today. But that's one of the things I always suggest if somebody asks me my opinion on what I've learned about having a YouTube channel. Oh, I don't think only one of them I throw. Lord. I always say if you are a sensitive person, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a sensitive person, nothing at all. It is actually a very wonderful quality to have. And I am sensitive about some things. I mean, usually it's animals, animals and little kids and elderly people. I could never work in an emergency room if little kids and elderly people came in because that would probably, that would just, oh, I don't know if I could do that. That would kill me. And I could never work at a vet's office because I don't want to see an animal in distress. I know it happens, but I don't want to see it. I just, I just don't want to see it. Where's the T? Did I mark the T? Oh, I didn't. Flibbity gibbet. Oh, I did mark the T. Okay, people. This is going to be a how not to today. So what I need to do now, the important thing that I need to do now, I need to attach just a little piece of fabric onto the top of this. And the reason why I want to do that is so that when this has my signatures attached to it, I can put it inside of here, whether I glue it down or leave it free, you know, whatever it is I decide to do. I honestly have not decided that yet. But if there's fabric on top of this, I can glue that down like I did this spine liner reinforcing fabric. I can glue that down and then put something over the edges to line the inside covers. You know, the raw edges will be hidden, but then when you turn the pages in the book and you get in between one signature and another signature, you won't see green paper through there. You'll see, hopefully, a piece of fabric that is more akin to the color that this is. Okay, I will be back momentarily with a piece of cloth for that. This'll do. I got this chunk of fabric, chunk of fabric, uh, from the thrift store for, I think it was two bucks, but it's kind of like, it looks like almost like a raw muslin. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but anyway, it's old looking already. I think it works great. I'm just going to find the edge and cut a little piece off. And it just needs to be an inch or so wider than the spine. I got a mess behind me. Because I sit here and I throw stuff behind me on the counter and it's like, <coughs> it's wow, it's wow. 
and I shall glue this to the back of this. And then I can trim around it. I'm gonna leave it a little bit long. All right, so I'm gonna start with the first signature. And you can start really wherever you wanna, but I'm gonna start with the first one. You can start with the last one. You can start with one in the, I don't care what you do, I'm not your mom. And I'm gonna trim these down after I get them sewn to this uh, spine back thing. I also need to poke holes through it so I can see where I'm going. So I can see the holes on the back, but I can't see through the front. I'm just gonna poke through here so that I can see the holes from the other direction. So there's the first one. And then, I mean, you're welcome to tie a knot or two or something to hold that first signature in place. I mean, if you pull hard enough, the knot will pull through. So, you know, don't get too hulk with it. And basically all I do is zigzag back and forth. Maybe I say that and then I can't find the hole through the signature. And I just go back and forth and back and forth. And the reason why you want an even number of holes through the spine and the signatures is so that you end up, you know, on this side of the spine piece. Because if you had an, an odd number, then you would end up on the inside. That would be your last hole. And then how would you get back out so that you could add the next signature or tie a knot or anything? That's why you want an even number. Sometimes you want an odd number. So like if you're doing a five hole pamphlet stitch where each signature is sewn in by itself, then that is a odd number of um, holes. My brain is not telling me how to do a weaver's knot right at this second. I don't want to stop and look it up again. ADHD is, it's a struggle, man. It's a struggle. It's like literally a weaver's knot is something that, I mean, I do all the time. Can I remember how to do it? Nope. <laughs> not right now, I can't. And it would take too long to look it up. So we're just, we're just not gonna. I will finish sewing on the rest of these pages and speed it up a little bit so that you're not sitting here for an extra, you know, hour or so. this isn't where I'm going to cut the pages. I'll cut shorter than that, but this is just to give me my, my guideline. And I mean, to cut these, uh, I don't know if I'm going to take it over to my, I have a choppy, you know, a uh, guillotine. If you are adept with a craft knife and 
a ruler, you can do it this way as well. But I think I'll take mine over to the to the guillotine. I don't know if I'm going to trust myself with a craft knife today. Okay, I've got it trimmed down. I think this will be adequate. However, I need to cut this down. What I'm going to do too is I'll do it from this side. But I'm going to, going to trim the corners of this off at an angle. so that it won't stick out above the whatever I put on the inside cover the liner paper or whatever it is that I line the inside covers with. Yay! Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to glue down this fabric and I'm going to go ahead and glue this to the spine in the back. Uh, you don't have to, but I am going to because it's going to open really, really easy anyway because the spine is very thin and very flexible. If the spine of your book is super rigid, I wouldn't do that because then your pages won't be able to open up as easily. It'll, it'll stay tighter, but I don't have that problem. That it's not an issue with this one. So I'm going to go ahead and glue the paper part, the green part, down. If the spine of your book is real stiff and you don't want to glue um, this part that I'm putting glue on right now, you can set your text block, which that's what this is, it's a text block, you can set that inside your cover like I've been doing and you can carefully just lay it down without shifting the text block out of place and open up one cover and then just glue one of these fabric flaps down just from the, the edge of that paper to the edge onto the inside of your cover and then fold it over to the other side and do the same thing for the other flap. And then your spine area will be free from the spine of the book, the cover, and when you open up the book, then because it's not stuck down, it'll be able to open up and flex. But that is not what I'm doing. And this is the hardest part is probably <laughs> is getting everything inside even, even as possible. But it looks pretty good. I'm just going to let this sit for a few minutes and let it finish drying back there because I don't want to mess around with gluing down those little side pieces, those extra fabric flaps on the side until this dries and is secure because then I, I'll just dislodge everything and muck it all up because that's what I do. All right, I think that's dry. I'm going to use this piece of scrapbook paper that I had in my stash. I have no idea what pack or what company it's from, but I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm going to glue down these flaps here. I'm going to put this on the inside of the covers. Does that sound good? So I'm going to cut two pieces that are the size I need. So hold on to your horses. It should be about the right size. Yeah, that's fine. So I'll cut another one. There we go. Good enough. Good enough, Maynard. But first, I need to glue this down. I'm going to lay this back. I kind of close it a little bit, and if there's any wrinkles, I try to smush those down. Put that piece of paper in there so it protects the that front piece of paper. There we go. I will give that just a couple of minutes and then I can put these in. Alright, I think that is dry. And if I wanted to, I could totally add like a tie if I wanted to. I don't think I do. 
but if I did, I would probably glue it underneath, you know, the paper that goes on top if you wanted like to have a tie to tie the book close. But I'm not gonna. What I am gonna do, I'm going to use some double-sided tape to glue in or adhere the uh, liner paper because I am not too jazzed about introducing moisture to this inside cover that could warp my boards because if you saw my last video, which I will link down below, I talk about why book board warp and how I fixed a book that did that. But in this instance, if I introduced a whole bunch of moisture to this side, I'm not gonna be introducing any moisture to this side. So I wouldn't be able to balance that and fix that warp. So I'm not going to add that. Not a very good idea, I don't think. Now, if you have a type of glue that you want to use that doesn't have water in it, that might work. And I could probably get out some other glue, but you know, the tape was just right there. And I love this tape. I'm not even sponsored, but you will find it on my Amazon favorites list. The link is under the description. I will. I'm gonna burnish this down a little bit and make sure that the sticky side of the tape is really sticking. I'll do the back first. What I usually do is I take off just one strip of tape so that I can get everything like where I want it. And then that way I don't accidentally lay the whole thing down and then then we got to start over because it's got put down crooked or, you know, you know, you get it. Okay, there's the back. Voila. I thought it was nice because it matched the red in the cover. So I think that looks nice. Isn't this a great cover? And this piece here in the middle, I don't know if you can see it, but it's raised. It's like debossed. It's very pretty. So there is this little book and it didn't take hardly any time at all. If you are new to junk journaling and book binding in general, Definitely take your time. Don't rush through it or anything. Just because I said it didn't take very long. But um, yeah, I think this is something that even if you're new to bookbinding, this is something that maybe you could dip your toes into the bookbinding world and try something like this out. I venture to say that most people probably have some kind of book cover to use. Maybe it's a, an old reader's digest or an old dictionary or something that you don't use anymore. Well, don't recycle it. You can recycle the inside if you want to, or you could keep it and use it for book pages. But yeah, maybe use it for making some kind of a journal. You don't have to put random pages in like I did. You can always just use blank paper, you know, copy paper or any kind of paper whatever you'd like. You can go to the dollar store and get an inexpensive pad of drawing paper or mixed media, uh, watercolor paper, whatever floats your boater. You could make one for a friend if you don't think you'd use it or for a kid for a, a little drawing book or a little diary for somebody. Travel journal if somebody's going on a trip. A wedding guest book. Search through here and find place interesting places to put their name and address and maybe salutations for the bride and groom. How about a baby book? But yeah, you can make one of these for very, very, very little money. 
just some time. The first one that you make probably won't be perfect, but that's okay. You really don't want it to be perfect because we don't learn any lessons or <laughs> any workarounds or anything if, if something just turns out perfect. And then when a problem does come up, then we're like, we don't know what to do because the first one was perfect. Well, we don't want the first one to be perfect. Take that pressure right off yourself. So don't use a book cover that you adore. Don't start with that. Start with something boring, and if it comes out great, then it will be a happy little accident. So that is all for me today. I will take my leave and let you get back to your life. I hope you enjoyed this project. Maybe it gave you a little bit of inspiration. Even if you're not new to junk journaling and you really didn't learn anything new, maybe it was inspirational. I appreciate all of you being here today. Thank you again so very much, and I will see you all really, really soon in the next video. Bye guys.